forest. Forests, the oldest and most diverse ecosystem, are important for their products. They also keep soil fertile, ensure the supply of constant water under the ground, regulate the climate and prevent floods. The leaves which have fallen to the ground become some kind of substance. This substance which is called humus is a fertilizer to the soil. Humus holds rain water during the wet season, stores it and then waters the fields in the dry season. Thus the fields can produce more crops. For years many people haven't been obeying the government's regulations and have been cutting down the trees excessively. As a result, thousands of hectares of what used to be good forest lands have become waste. These people are not aware that without forest nothing prevents the water will wash away the soil to the river. It may cause floods which will destroy the farmland and villages. For all this reason, the State Minister of Development, Supervision and Environment has consistently been trying to keep on asking our people to stop destroying the forest and conducting the campaign for forest conservation. What is global warming? Global warming is a term used to describe a gradual increase in the Earth's average ground and atmospheric temperatures across the whole planet. Measurements indicate that the global temperature has increased by about 1 degree Fahrenheit in the past century. This warming trend appeared during a period when human activities were beginning to increase the carbon dioxide, CO2, and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Although most scientists believe that a rise in carbon dioxide emissions will lead to further global warming, uncertainties remain about the timing and severity of resulting climatic change. Nevertheless, many are convinced that human activities are partly responsible for the long-term warming of the past century and that climatic changes caused by greenhouse gas increases will be a continuing part of our future. The impact of global warming could be devastating. Global warming causes ozone depletion, melting polar ice, and rising ocean levels. The ozone layer, which protects all life from ultraviolet UV radiation, is being destroyed by the release of chlorofluorocarbons CFCs, into the atmosphere. The widening holes in the ozone layer allow in more UV rays, which can cause skin cancers, cataracts, and immune system damage. UV rays are detrimental to pollination, seed production, and marine life food supplies as well. Ice sheets in the Arctic Ocean have receded to record lows, and Antarctic glaciers are melting at a fast rate causing sea levels to rise and indigenous wildlife to lose its habitat. Rising ocean levels could eventually cause worldwide flooding of coastal areas, forcing people and wildlife to migrate inland. Many experts predict global warming will cause a dramatic increase in excessive rainfall in some areas and severe drought in others, resulting in floods, crop failures, and a rising number of forest fires and landslides. Many of the world's most knowledgeable climate change scientists forecast that the Earth's temperature will rise from 1.44 to 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100 if we don't take steps to reduce greenhouse gases. An increase of 1 to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit will occur even if we do act, because many gases have already been released. Behavior and work habits in the workplace Smart and quiet behavior in the workplace can cause areas or even fatal accidents. Behavior like this is called horseplay. If you interfere with the work of others or make practical joking, it can also be very safe. Horseplay, running, and throwing objects in the workplace are good work habits and can cause accidents. Bad work habits keep a workplace dangerous.
A dangerous worker is messy in his habits. He keeps a messy bench in a messy store. The floor around the bench or machine is never dirty. He always puts rubbish and waste into the wrong bins. In this way, he prevents obstruction of fire. A dangerous worker does not wait for accident to happen. He never takes actions after they happen. If he sees some oil on the floor, he does not leave it there. Somebody may slip on that oil and so he wipes it up. He does not leave tools lying around or on top of machines. Tools can fall into the moving parts of a machine. The machine may be damaged, or the operator may be badly injured. The dangerous worker does these things through habits. As he works, he is thinking of the safety. He is trying to remove the safety. He is thinking not only of himself, but also of his fellow workers. Dear Jude, how are you, my friend? I'm really sorry I couldn't send you an email earlixer. I'm really busy with my final exam preparation. I have to read a lot of books. Besides that, I must attend extra classes for English and science every afternoon and go to the gym at weekends. I really thank you for hosting me during my holiday. It was the best holiday I've ever had. I'm really grateful that I finally could travel to England and explore the famous places over there with you. I can't stop seeing our pictures during the trips. It's really fun to remember our good time together. Jude, I'd love to spend my holiday with you again. Will you come to visit me during your summer holiday? I will have finished my exam and therefore I can take you to interesting and historical places in my city and other neighboring areas. I'm sure we will have a lot of fun, too. I'm very excited about this. Please let me know soon. Thanks again. For your kindness. Melody. Bandung, my hometown, is a very interesting place. If you like shopping, you can visit Dago and Sihampelas. In those area, there are so many factory outlets, which apparently attract many Jakarta people who like to shop. These shops are popular for their cheap price. If you go to upper part of Dago, you will see lots of cafes too. These cafes are famous because you can enjoy tasty food and bond on beautiful view at the same time. The air is cold and fresh, because there is no factory nearby and very limited number of cars, just like in the old days. Another place that you can visit is Lembong. It is located a little bit outside the Bandung city and famous for the cold air, which is perfect for holidays. Lembong is also famous for cow's milk, baked sticky rice, and also strawberry plantations. In the strawberry plantations, you can pick and eat any strawberries you want for some amount of monsi that you have to pay. You can also eat some foods made from strawberries. The strawberry plantations cause more and more tourists to come to Bandung. Besides that, Bandung is also famous for the tea plantations and the mountains such as Tengkuban Prahu and Kawapuda. Apart from that, Bandung is also famous for its schools. Bandung has a lot of other interesting aspects too, such as various foods and cultural products. I have got an unforgettable experience last Lebron day. My family and I went to my mother's hometown to celebrate, Idol Fitri. We went by aeroplane. At the airport, my family and I had to walk through the metal detector. When I got the turn to walk through it, suddenly the alarm beeped. The woman who worked as the airport security said, Come here, you need to get your belt off. I took my belt off, but the alarm still beeped. The security asked me to take my wallet from my pocket. I did what she ordered. Still, the alarm beeped. 
After that the security asked me to turn back and she checked my body. She touched my left pocket. Then she told me, there was something in it. It might be the thing that made the alarm beeped. I took out something from the left pocket. The woman laughed and said, that has made the alarm beep. It was a silver pen. I felt embarrassed because Eve Bod stared at me with curiosity. My holiday to Bali. I was in Senio's high school when I went to Bali Island for the first time. I went there with my teacher and my friends. It was our school study tour. My teacher, my classmates, and I were in the same bus. We left our school at 8 a.m. The journey from Patti to Bali took one day. I was so exhausted because I had to sit along the journey. Actually, it was an enjoyable journey because I spent time with my friends. We did many things together, like playing games, laughing, and joking. I was tired but I didn't mind. All of my treadness was gone when we arrived at the Sanner Beach, where our hotel was located. It was still early momming, we saw a beautiful sunrise. After watching the sunrise, we were driven to the hotel to take a rest and to have meals. After that, we went to the Nusa Dua Beach. There were so many activities to do there, like parasailing, banana boat, and so on. But, I chose to go to a little island which had a lot reptile. There were snakes, turtles, etc. The scenery was so beautiful because it was in the middle of the sea. Next, we went to Garuda Wizanu Kenkana, GWK. There were two amazing statues. They were Wizanu and his bird, called Garuda. After a very long journey, through the land and the sea, we finally got back to the hotel. Although we tired, we all happy. We could not wait to visit other beautiful places. What are thunder and lightning? Lightning is a sudden, violent flash of electricity between a cloud and the ground, or from cloud to cloud. A lightning flash, or bolt, can be several miles long. It is so hot, with an average temperature of 34,000 centigrade, that the air around it suddenly expands with a loud blast. This is the thunder we hear. Lightning occurs in hot, wet storms. Moist air is driven up to a great height. It forms a type of cloud called cumulonimbus. When the cloud rises high enough, the moisture freezes and ice crystals and snowflakes are formed. These begin to fall, turning to rain on the way down. This rain meets more moist air rising and it is the friction between them which produces static electricity. When a cloud is fully charged with this electricity, it discharges it as a lightning flash. Gawai Day or Gawai Dayak Gawai Day or Gawai Dayak is a festival celebrated in Sarawak. It is both a religious and social occasion. Gawai Dayak literally means Dayak Festival. Dayak visit their friends and relatives on this day. Those far away receive greeting cards. The mode of celebrations varies from place to place. The festival is celebrated on the 1st of June every year, however, it actually starts on the evening of 31% of May. Gawai Dayak celebration may last for several days. On the evening of 31st of May, the ceremony to cast the greediness spirit away, Mul Antu Rua, is held. Then, offering ceremony, Miring, is conducted. Thanking good for the good harvest, guidance, blessings and long life is done through sacrificing a cockerel. At midnight spirit welcoming procession, Nalu Patera, is held. Then, the celebration gets merrier as people start singing and reading poems. On the 1% of June, the homes of the Dayaks are open to visitors. Cockfighting, 
blowpipe skill demonstration, and Najat competitions are held. It is also during this time of the year that many Dayak weddings take place. Today, it is an integral part of Dayak social life. It is a Thanksgiving day marking good harvest and a time to plan for the new farming season or activities ahead. Kangaroo A kangaroo is an animal found only in Australia, although it has a smaller relative, called a wallaby, which lives on the Australian island of Tasmania and also in New Guinea. Kangaroos eat grass and plants, they have short front legs, but very long, and very strong back legs and a tail. These are used for sitting up and for jumping. Kangaroos have been known to make forward jumps of over 8 meters, and leap across fences more than 3 meters high. They can also run at speeds of over 45 kilometers per hour. The largest kangaroos are the great gray kangaroo and the red kangaroo. Adults grow to a length of 1.60 meters and weigh 90 kilos. Kangaroos are marsupials. This means that the female kangaroo has an external pouch on the front of her body. A baby kangaroo is very tiny when it is born, and it crawls at once into this pouch where it spends its first five months of life. Antibiotic Antibiotic is a drug produced by certain microbes. Antibiotics destroy other microbes that damage human tissues. They are used to treat a wide variety of diseases, including gonorrhea, tonsillitis and tuberculosis. Antibiotics are sometimes called wonder drugs because they can cure diseases such as meningitis, pneumonia and scarlet fever. But when the antibiotics are overused, are misused, these drugs make a person sensitive being attacked by a superbug. Antibiotics do not always distinguish between harmless and dangerous microbes. If a drug destroys too many harmless microorganisms, the pathogenic ones the dangerous microbes will have a greater chance to multiply. This situation often leads to the development of a new infection called suprainfection. Extensive use of some antibiotics may damage organs and tissues. For example, streptomycin, which is used to treat tuberculosis, has caused kidney damage and deafness. Resistance to antibiotics may be acquired by pathogenic microbes. The resistant microbes transfer genetic material to non-resistant microbes and cause them to become resistant. During antibiotic treatment, non-resistant microbes are destroyed, but resistant types survive and multiply. To avoid the side effect of antibiotics, you'd better not urge your doctor to prescribe antibiotics. Keep in mind that antibiotics are only useful for bacterial infections, and have no effect on viruses, so they cannot be used for chicken pox, measles, and other viral diseases. The Japanese Traditional House The Japanese traditional house made of wood is expected to last about 20 years before having to be repaired or rebuilt. Each year it is depreciated. The interior design is what really sets the Japanese traditional house. With the exception of the entryway, ginkan, the kitchen, datokuro, the bathing room, sento, and the toilet, benjo, the rooms in a Japanese traditional house does not have a designated use. A room can easily be a living area, a bedroom, a dining room or any combination. Large rooms are partitioned by fusuma, sliding doors made of wood and thick paper. The paper used for fusuma is called washi. These sliding doors can be removed whenever a larger space is needed. In Yarge traditional houses, there was one large room, or ima living space, that could be divided as needed. The smaller rooms like kitchen, bath and toilet were small extensions to one side. 
ruka, or wooden floored hallways, follow the edge of the home. Windows are made of wood and shoji paper, which is thin enough to let the light shine through. Even Japanese modern houses tend to have one traditional Japanese room, called a washitsu. This room has tatami mats on the floor is used in Japanese traditional house. Tatami are thick straw mats covered with stitched, woven rushes. Tatami are smooth and firm enough to walk on, while making a sleeping surface more comfortable than wood or stone. The genkin is usually a step below the level of the rest of the house. When people enter the home, they leave their shoes in the genkin, pointed toward the door so they only need to slip them on when they are ready to go out. Indoor shippers are often worn inside the house. The kitchen in most traditional Japanese homes will contain a stove with a very small oven and broiler and an electric refrigerator. Counter space for food preparation and a sink are also located in the kitchen. The bathing room contains a tub and is often waterproof. An adjacent area is available for showering. The Japanese reuse bath water, either for other bathers or for washing laundry, so it is important not to dirty the water with soap and dirt. Dirty portions of the body can be washed before stepping into the bath. Let's make the city clean and fresh. A clean and fresh city will surely make the inhabitants healthy. Every morning especially in dry season, all roads must be watered with clean water and swept by the workers of regional government under the mayor's instruction. To protect people from heavy pollution caused by cars, trucks and motorcycles, enough trees must be planted along the roads. Every building or house in the city must be surrounded by short and small trees which bear colorful flowers. Bad and improper habits which cause disadvantages, such as smoking and throwing rubbish anywhere should be stopped at once. The city mayor will have to think over the way to educate people, so they realize how important cleanliness and health are. More public lavatories are badly needed. It will be wise if the city mayor decides a certain amount of fine to be paid by those who break the government regulation on cleanliness matter. For example, a man who urinates not at a lavatory, smokes not at a smoking room or throws rubbish at the roads should be fined. Besides dirtying the environment with cigarettes butts, Smoking will also cause pollution and bad lung diseases to other people. So, bad habits and impolite attitudes should be immediately stopped, otherwise the city will be dirty, unhealthy, badly polluted and will never attract foreign and domestic tourists as well. Whales Whales are the largest animals on the earth. Bigger than elephants, they may grow 95 feet long, and weigh 150 tons. A baby blue whale, just born, can be 23 feet long and weigh 3 tons. Although whales live in the oceans and swim like fish, they are not fish. They are mammals, like cows and elephants. Unlike fish they bear young alive, not as eggs. Their babies live on their mother's milk. They breathe through their lungs and hold their breath when they go underwater. If they cannot come to the surface to breathe fresh air, they will drown. They are warm-blooded. Fish, however, lay eggs, breathe oxygen in the water, and are cold-blooded. Whales live in all the ocean. In the winter some of them go to warm waters to breed and in the summer most of them go to cold waters to feed. There are two kinds of whales, whales with teeth, tooted whales, and whales without teeth, baleen whales. The toothed whales eat fish and squid, which they can catch with their teeth, although they swallow their food without chewing it. The baleen whales eat plankton, small sea animals and plants. When they find plankton, 
they open their mouth and swallow the plankton. Whales have few enemies. Only human and killer whale attack whales. And whales do not seem to fight among themselves. They usually live from 20 to 30 years. Guatabuhan is a lively unique cave. In the cave NYI, Mrs. Kamiyam and Key, Mr. Padmo sit on a stone. NYI Kamiyam will sing a song and Key Padma will beat the drum. Joining them are people called Wiyogo which are drummers and other gamelan musicians. What makes this unique is that they mix gamelan with the sound of nature. The visitors dance, forgetting all problems. Many tourists go to this cave. Maybe you are interested in going there too. But you don't know where it is Guatabuhan is located near Paisitan in East Java. It is situated in a lime hill called Tapan, in Tabuhan, Warang village. The route is easy. Along the road there is beautiful tropical scenery to enjoy rice fields, coconut palms and birds. East of the cave peddlers sell souvenirs. The drink and food peddlers are on the north. People sell agates on the cave terraces. Somehow, it is like a fair. It is said that the cave is the only place where nature produces sounds like the music of gamelan. NYI Kamiyam, the well-down peasant and traditional Javanese singer, from the village of Gabuhan, who often sings in the cave, does not doubt it. Guatabuhan did not use to welcome visitor. According to Kartau Rio, 90, village elder, Guatabuhan used to be a hiding place for robbers. It was believed to be a sacred place. No one dared go inside. However, Wedana, chief of a district Kurtadiproho, went to the cave to find out what was wrong. He found out that the cave was inhabited by the annoying evil spirits. The people chased the spirits away. The cave is dark, so people need light, and a local guide will lead the way. Sometimes visitors bump their heads against the sharp rocks on the ceiling. Inside the cave there is a plain. Big stone which is believed to be the prayer mat of Pengaran de Ponegoro, one of the Indonesia heroes who fought against the Dutch. It is said that Pengaran de Ponegoro used to seclude himself in the cave. Some people now use the place for meditation. There is a stream in the cave, in the east corner, which can only be seen outside. However, it can be heard from inside. Besides the cave, Watukarang, a beach nearby, is good to visit. By the way, want different souvenirs? You can find them in Donorojo village where agate craftsmen work. So, have a nice journey. Bali Action The amazing choice of different activities available in Bali means that there is indeed something for everyone. Whether you want to throw yourself from high attitudes, hurtle down frothing rapids, explore the wonders of the deep or just lie back and take it easy. Bali has perfected the art of keeping its guests happy. The beach is a major factor in any island holiday and Bali has a coastline which offers every possible water activity including surfing some of the best waves in the world, swimming with dolphins, cruises, snorkeling, diving, sailing and parasailing. For snorkeling and diving, the closest spots to Kuta are Banoa and Sanor beaches where all the relevant equipment can be hired. Further afield, good destinations include Pulau Sarangan, Nusa Panita and Nusa Lambongan in the south, Padang Bai, Candidasa, Tulamban and Aimed in the east, Labina in the north and the amazing Pulau Menjangan in the northwest. Bali's waves are world famous and range from safe beach breaks for beginners like Kuta to the awesome swells at Padang Padang, Uluwatu and Nusa Lambongan which regularly attract the pros.
Beginners should respect the sea and stay within depth to start with as the current can be very strong. Apart from Kuta and Legian beaches, Medui is also good for beginners. For the more experienced, Nusa Dua has a number of breaks as does Saner, Kengu. Katul and the area around the airport are also popular with experienced surfers. Niagara Falls Niagara Falls is a famous area of waterfalls. It is one of the most beautiful natural wonders of North America. It is on the Niagara River, about halfway between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. The Niagara River forms part of the border between Canada and the United States. At Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada is on one side of the river, and the U.S. state of New York is on the other side. Niagara Falls really has two waterfalls. The Horseshoe Falls are in Canada, and the American Falls are in the United States. The Niagara River drops into a steep gorge or canyon, at the falls. Most of the water flows over the Horseshoe Falls. They are not as high as the American Falls, but they are 2,600 feet, 792 meters, wide about 0.5 mile, 0.8 kilometers. The American Falls are about 1,000 feet, 305 meters wide. Beyond the falls are the Whirlpool Rapids. There, the powerful swirling water has carved a bowl out of the rock. At night, colored lights shine on the thundering falls. About 10 million people visit Niagara Falls each year. The Wolf and the Dog Once there was a wolf who was nearly dead with hunger. He was very thin, so that the outline of his bones could be seen clearly beneath his thinning coat of hair. With hardly enough energy to walk, the wolf had little hope of finding food. As he lay beneath a large tree, a dog out for a walk noticed him. Seeing how thin and hungry looking the wolf was, the dog felt sorry for him and said, You are in terrible shape. You look as if you haven't eaten for many days. You're right, said the wolf. I haven't eaten because you and your friends are doing such a good job of guarding the sheep. Now I am so weak that I have little hope of finding food. I think I will surely die. Then why not join us? Asked the dog. I work regularly and I eat regularly. You could do the same. I will arrange it. You can help me and the other dogs guard the sheep. In that way, we won't have to worry about your stealing the sheep anymore and you won't have to worry about going hungry anymore. It's a good deal for both of us. The wolf thought it over for a few minutes and then decided that the dog was right. So they went off together toward the ranch house where the dog lived. But, as they were walking, the wolf noticed that the hair on a certain part of the dog's neck was very thin. He was curious about this, for the dog had such a beautiful coat everywhere else. Finally, he asked the dog about it. Oh, don't worry about that, said the dog. It's the place where the collar rubs on my neck when my master chains me up at night. Chained up, cried the wolf. Do you mean that you are chained up at night? If I come to live with you, will I be chained up at night too? That's right, answered the dog. But, you'll get used to it soon enough. I hardly think about it anymore. But, if I am chained up, then I won't be able to walk when I want to take a walk or to run where I want to run, the wolf said. If come to live with you. I won't be free anymore. After saying this, the wolf turned and tan away. The dog called after the wolf, saying, Wait, come back. I may not be able to do everything I want to do, but I'm healthy, well fed, and I have a warm place to sleep. You are too worried about keeping alive to enjoy life. I'm more free than you are.
taken from www.asafables.com. The Fox and the Crow A crow, perched in a tree with a piece of cheese in his beak, attracted the eye and nose of a fox. If you can sing as prettily as you sit, said the fox, then you are the prettiest singer within my scent and sight. The fox had read somewhere, and somewhere, and somewhere else, that praising the voice of a crow with a cheese in his beak would make him drop the cheese and sing. But this is not what happened to this particular crow in this particular case. They say you are sly and they say you are crazy, said the crow, having carefully removed the cheese from his beak with the claws of one foot, but you must be nearsighted as well. Warblers wear gay hats and colored jackets and bright vest, and they are a dollar a hundred. I wear black and I am unique. I am sure you are, said the fox, who was neither crazy nor nearsighted, but sly. I recognize you, now that I look more closely, as the most famed and talented of all birds, and I fain would hear you tell about yourself, but I am hungry and must go. Tarry a while, said the crow quickly, and share my lunch with me. Whereupon he tossed the cunning fox the lion's share of the cheese, and began to tell about himself. A ship that sails without a crow's nest sails to doom, he said. Bars may come and bars may go, but crow bars last forever. I am the pioneer of flight. 1 a.m. the map maker. Last, but never least, my flight is known to scientists and engineers, geometricians, and scholar, as the shortest distance between two points. Any two points, he concluded arrogantly. Oh, every two points, I am sure, said the fox. And thank you for the lion's share of what I know you could not spare. And with this he trotted away into the woods, his appetite appeased, leaving the hungry crow perched forlornly in the tree. Taken from www.asafables.com The Tiger Who Would Be King One morning the tiger woke up in the jungle and told his mate that he was king of beasts. Leo the lion, is king of beasts, she said. We need a change, said the tiger. The creatures are crying for a change. The tigress listened but she could hear no crying, except that of her cubs. Teal be king of beasts by the time the moon rises, said the tiger. It will be a yellow moon with black stripes, in my honor. Oh sure, said the tigress as she went to look after her young, one of whom, a male, very like his father, had got an imaginary thorn in his paw. The tiger prowled through the jungle till he came to the lion's then. Come out, he roared, and greet the king of beasts. The king is dead, long live the king. Inside the den, the lioness woke her mate. The king is here to see you, she said. What king? He inquired, sleepily. The king of beasts, she said. I am the king of beasts, roared Leo and he charged out of the den to defend his crown against the pretender. It was a terrible fight and it lasted until the setting of the sun. All the animals of the jungle joined in some taking the side of the tiger and others the side of the lion. Every creature from the aardvark to the zebra took part in the struggle to overthrow the lion or to repulse the tiger, and some did not not know which they were fighting for, and some fought for both, and some fought whoever was nearest and some fought for the sake of fighting. What are we fighting for? Someone asked the aardvark. The old order said the aardvark. What are we dying for? Someone asked the zebra. The new order, said the zebra. When the moon rose, 
fevered and gibbous, it shone upon a jungle in which nothing stirred except a macaw and a cockatoo, screaming in horror. All the beasts were dead except the tiger, and his days were numbered and his time was ticking away. He was monarch of all he surveyed, but it didn't seem to mean anything. Taken from Readings to Remember, 2004 Making an Omelette This is the way an omelette should be made. It is important that the frying pan should be proportionate to the number of eggs, in other words, to the size of the omelette. The frying pan must be made of iron, not of aluminium, tin or enamel. And here I feel I must stress a point essential to what might be called the background of omelet making, namely that the frying pan must never be washed with water but rubbed, when hot, with salt and tissue paper, as this is the only way to prevent sticking. For three portions, we take six eggs, break them into a bowl, season them with salt and freshly ground pepper, and add a good teaspoonful of water. We beat this lightly with a fork or the wire broom, not the whisk, until large bubbles form on the top. This takes half a minute. It is fatal to be too long. Meanwhile, our frying pan is getting hot, not too hot, and we drop in an ounce and a half of butter, or butter and best lard, over a quick flame for a minute or two, until it gives no more froth and has turned light golden. We give our egg mixture another stir and pour it into the pan, letting it spread evenly over the frying pan. All this is a swift business, and we may well feel a few extra heartbeats and a little breathlessness at that moment. The flame is now tuned down a little. With a fork or palette knife, a fork seems to work particularly well, we loosen the edges of the omelet all round and once or twice, in the middle, letting the liquid flow into the empty spaces, taking care always to move towards the middle. This takes about two minutes. Then, keeping as calm as we possibly can, we fold it. This is easy if we fold over and pin down with two or three fork pricks about an inch and a half of the omelet along one side. Then, it is quite easy to roll it into shape. Our omelette should be golden brown outside and wet inside, bayviews, as the classical French term says. It is then slid onto a hot plate and its surface made shiny with a little butter. This last touch makes all the difference. The cleverest student.